Today is Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Coming up, a Roland Martin unfiltered. Since Donald Trump could not steal the 2020 election, Republicans are trying to do it for him. We'll be joined by Ari Berman, a voting rights expert for Mother Jones, to break this down. And um, uh, Sonseria Ann Barry is now the first African-American Secretary of the United States Senate. Also, Chiquita brooks LaShore, a Democratic health policy expert, is a leading candidate to run President Joe Biden's Medicare and Medicaid agency. Also, a former Trump administration official said in an interview that Secretary of Defense Lord Austin was chosen for his for, for the job because of his skin color. <laughs> really? Are you that dumb? Really? That dumb? And uh, right now, Congress is debating whether to strip the committee assignments of QAnon supporter, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Oh, y'all ought to hear the white tears she said today on the floor. And wait until we show you how Senator Ted Cruz tried to jam up uh, Biden's pick for the United Nations ambassador because of the speech, speech she gave at an HBCU. Senator Cory Booker came to her uh, defense. Prosecutors won an arrest warrant for Kyle Rittenhouse because he's ignoring the conditions of his bond. His ass should be in jail. And country star Morgan Wallen has been suspended, could lose his record deal, uh, and because his neighbor recorded him shouting the N-word. Oh, you hear that apology as well. Y'all, let's get to it. It's time to bring the funk. Roll with my unfiltered. Let's go. Donald Trump and Republicans did all they could to lie about the 2020 election. Oh, we can we can run them all. Trump, Kevin McCarthy, they all were lying when it came to the uh, election. Now Republicans uh, in Georgia and other states are going to do their damnedest to actually steal the election in 2022 and 2024. This is a huge issue. But the question is, are Democrats going to have the guts to move forward with the John Lewis voting bill, they could actually do that, use their power to prevent Republicans from doing this on the state level. Joining us right now is Ari Berman. Uh, he, of course, uh, is with uh, Mother Jones. Uh, he is a senior reporter there, has been uh, focusing on these issues for a, bit, for a long time. Ari, right, glad to have you in Roland Martin Unfiltered. This is critically important. Republicans can control these legislatures in these southern states. They control the governor's mansions as well. And so they control the state Supreme Court. So the only real way for Democrats to stop the steal, if you will, uh, is if they enact the John Lewis Act on a federal level, because that is what is needed. The question is, will they have the guts to move forward and get it done immediately? That's right, Roland. The Republicans control the states. They control places like Georgia, and they are hell-bent on trying to make it harder to vote so there isn't a repeat of 2020, so there isn't the same kind of turnout, particularly among younger voters, black voters, voters of color, that there was in 2020 in future elections. So Republicans control the states, but Democrats control Washington, meaning they have the power, finally, to put in place federal standards and federal regulations for voting. They can pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to restore the Voting Rights Act, and they can pass the For the People Act, which would be the most significant democracy reform bill in a generation. Now, the only way they can do that is to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, because these bills are not going to get 60 votes in the U.S. Senate, but they could easily get 50 votes in the <coughs> U.S. Senate. Every Democrat votes for it. So that's the big question. Are they willing to get rid of the filibuster, which President Obama called a Jim Crow relic in, in, in order 
to stop all of these new voter suppression laws. If they're not willing to do that, then it's going to be very, very difficult for them to fight these voter suppression laws through the state legislatures or through the courts. So how will the federal bill, how will that protect voting rights? How will that, I won't say invalidate, but how will that keep the Republicans in these southern states from stealing the election through voter suppression? So with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, states that have both a long but also more recent history of voting discrimination, like Georgia, would once again have to approve their voting changes with the federal government. So the Justice Department would now have the power to block new restrictions on voting. Georgia is talking about doing things like getting rid of no excuse absentee voting where everyone in Georgia can vote by mail, getting rid of automatic voter registration adding new voter ID requirements. These are all things that would be discriminatory that would violate the Voting Rights Act. And if there was teeth, once again, put in the Voting Rights Act, you could block those laws that way. There's also legislation, the For the People Act, that would set federal standards for federal elections. It wouldn't allow you to do discriminatory voter purging. It wouldn't allow you to add new voter ID laws. It wouldn't allow you to add these kind of discriminatory changes. So these bills really work hand in hand. The For the People Act would add standards that apply to all 50 states, whereas the John Lewis Voting Rights Act would target those states that are the worst offenders when it comes to voting rights, places like Georgia. And so if those federal protections are put in place, and if they're put in place soon, they would then apply to the 2020 and the 2024 elections. And Democrats would actually have power to stop these new voter suppression laws, as opposed to trying to just litigate against them after the fact which is very, very difficult when you're dealing with very conservative courts that we have right now. But you've got folks like West Virginia Senator Joe, Joe Manchin who says under no circumstances will he, will he consider getting rid of the filibuster. He says that now. I, I think what the Democratic leadership is thinking is that if Republicans obstruct enough bills, then Joe Manchin and also Kirsten Sinema from Arizona might reconsider. Uh, but there's a lot at stake here. First off, there's power for the Democratic Party at stake. If Republicans are allowed to pass all of these new voter suppression laws, all of these extremely gerrymandered maps, that's going to hurt the Democratic Party. That might cost them the House in 2022. That might cost them the Senate. That might cost them the presidency. So it hurts the Democratic Party. But more broadly, it hurts democracy. We saw record turnout in the 2020 election. And that's the very thing that the Republican Party feels threatened by. So if I'm Kirsten Cinema in Arizona and I see that there's record turnout in my state and suddenly all these efforts are being put in place to try to roll back that kind of turnout, the same kind of turnout that helped elect me, and I'm thinking, do I want to save American democracy or do I want to save the filibuster so that 41 Republican senators can block any legislation proposed by the Democrats? I don't think this is a very difficult call for them. And in fact, when you talk about uh, cinema. She needs to be focused on this because the Supreme Court has taken up uh, a, a, an assault on Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And so that could very well affect her state. That's absolutely right. The Supreme Court is going to hear a case from Arizona, a Kirsten Sinema's home state, that could be make, make it harder to vote in that state. There's all sorts of crazy bills that have been introduced by Arizona Republicans already. They want to get rid of no excuse absentee voting in a state where 80 percent of the people vote by mail. They want to dramatically close a number of polling places, even while they make it harder to vote by mail. So in Maricopa County, Arizona, they want to go from having 100 vote centers in Maricopa County, where you can vote anywhere in the county, to having only 15 voting centers. That's going to directly affect someone like Kirsten Cinema. There's another bill in Arizona that would just say that the legislature can appoint whatever electors they want in the presidential election, no matter what the voters of the state say. So this, this is crazy stuff for democracy, but it also threatens Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly's self-interest as Democrats. They need large turnout from young voters, from voters of color, to be able to win elections. And if those things are rolled back, it's going to be bad for democracy, but it's also going to be bad for them as well. So from a purely self-interest perspective, you think they'd want to get rid of the filibuster. But I just think it's fundamentally undemocratic when 41 senators can block anything that's supported by a huge majority of Americans. And then that paralyzes the Congress from being able to do anything about attacks on democracy. So one anti-democratic institution, the filibuster, is then allowing you to continue all of these other anti-democratic institutions like voter suppression at the state and federal level. But this is where 
again, where for me, I've always had a problem with Democrats not having guts. Republicans have no problem changing rules to drive their agenda. Mitch McConnell can complain and bitch and moan all day uh, about Senator Harry Reid changing the rules for, um, for these lower level judges once. McConnell did it twice, including the Supreme Court. That's absolutely right. I mean, that's why it was so ridiculous to hear Mitch McConnell talk about preserving the filibuster. He already got rid of the filibuster uh, to confirm uh, Neil Gorsuch, to confirm uh, Amy Coney Barrett. So they have no problem. They don't care about hypocrisy. They don't care about shamelessness. All they care is exercising power. And I've said this for a long time. Democrats have to be as aggressive about fighting voter suppression as Republicans are at doing it. And they're not there yet. And the fact that the Democrats are not on board yet with getting rid of the filibuster is very, very worrisome because democracy is at stake right now. We are seeing it play out in the states. We just had an election where a big lie was said for months that led to a violent coup uh, at the U.S. Capitol. And now Republicans are trying to take up that big lie through other means. They're trying to accomplish through legislation what they couldn't accomplish through litigation. And Democrats need to be very, very serious about what's happening in front of them and realize that this is their moment to pass big transformative change, including a new Voting Rights Act. If they don't do it now, they might never get another chance to do it anytime soon. And, and in fact, here's the other piece. If Democrats don't do this, they're going to get killed in 2022. They, because here's the deal. You can't spend all this money and go out here telling people, let's get John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock in the United States Senate for us to be able to control it, and then you don't do a damn thing with it. Then you, then you play this game of, no, let's bipartisanship, let's all get together. No, as it stands right now, it's 50-50. You can run the table on your agenda, and if the other side starts yelling and screaming, all you got to say is, I'm going to show you the hand, because y'all gave us the finger for four years when Trump was there. That's how you wield power. And if you don't wield power, you're going to piss off the very people who went out there and uh, sacrificed themselves, tempted COVID, uh, stood in line, because they're going to say, what the hell we do all that for if y'all not going to do anything with the power? Well, that's absolutely right. In Georgia... Uh, Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff were very, very clear. They said over and over, send us to Congress so can we can pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And I think it's going to be very hard for them to go back home and say, well, we wanted to pass it, but there's this thing called the filibuster and Republicans wouldn't let us. No, you were elected to Congress with a mandate to do this. John Ossoff didn't have an asterisk under his tweets about a new Voting Rights Act that it could then be blocked by 41 Republican senators. So Democrats have to realize they have a mandate, and they have a mandate for big structural Democratic change after an election that Republicans tried to steal. And now they're already trying to steal the next one. And if they don't deliver, democracy is going to be undermined, and it's also going to hurt them with their own voters. So I really think there's no reason for them not to do this. People are always saying, well, if you eliminate the filibuster, Republicans could come in and they could pass bad laws. Well, guess what? Republicans are going to do that anyway. If Republicans want to get rid of the filibuster, they will get rid of the filibuster. They've already gotten rid of it for Supreme Court nominations. They've already rammed things through, like tax cuts for the rich under Trump with 51 votes. So they will do whatever it takes to control power. And Democrats, when they have power, have to use it, or else democracy will suffer, and they will suffer as well. All right, Berman, with Mother Jones, we still appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. All right, let's go to our panel. Reese Colbert, Black Women Views, Erica Savage-Wilson, host of Savage Politics Podcast, Dr. Greg Carr, chair of Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University. Reese, the point I made there about getting penalized, and I'm telling you right now, if they don't use the power, people are going to be pissed off. They're going to say, I'm not going to go out there and bust my ass to get you elected if you're not going to do anything with it. And so they better wield that damn power. Absolutely. I mean, it's time. The time for excuses is over. We don't want to hear that, that, that shit about the filibuster. It's old news. We played it out during the Obama administration. Now y'all have all three chambers. or We have the House, the Senate, and you have the White House. Get it done. Period. Because we saw the ruthlessness that Republicans operate and Democrats need to step it up. The time for excuses is just over. It's played out, and people are sick of it. And like he, like Eric Berman just said, there was no asterisk when they made all these big promises. I saw today Chuck Schumer, majority leader, now I guess finally majority leader, that, they, that they've passed the organizing resolution. 
is sitting up there talking about hashtag cancel student debt, hashtag pass the Voting Rights Act. How about that? You got more pressing issues to worry about. He's sitting up there trying to press, you know, President uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris on executive orders to cancel student loan debt, and you ain't barely gotten them going in the Congress yet, in the Senate. So I, for one, am not going to be sympathetic to, nor am I going to be sitting up there trying to bust my ass, trying to convince people and, and arm twist them to vote in 2022 if Democrats sit up there and fumble the ball for the next two years. Look, by, 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 bottom line here, uh, Erica, is, look, you have to get gangster. Simple as that. President Barack Obama played nice with Republicans, and they got screwed over and over and over and over again. They got screwed on judges. They got screwed on nominees. They got screwed on Merrick Garland. And that's why you would think that the Biden folks and, and even some a lot of his staff, they say, oh, we've learned our lesson. We ain't playing that game this time around. This, you have to drive the agenda. And here's the other deal that I don't get. Well, if we change the filibuster, they might do when they get power. They have and they will. So if you want to guarantee you don't have power, play that game and see what happens. Erica? Oh, hi. It's all over talking in my ear, but... Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. And, you know, as we talk about these issues and you talked about all the folks that brave conditions in order to go out and make sure that there was power in the hands of Democrat for um, both the House, the Senate and in uh, the presidency, we have to remember and think about that this is the part of the engaged citizenry that needs to be activated and continue to push. Because when we think about what Senate Republicans did during 2020, they made sure that their homeboy was acquitted um, in mm -hmm. 2020. That happened at the top of 2020. They also made sure that everyone in the United States and the globe knew that the co-equal branch of government was corporations. And so because they made sure that that fact was known, they made sure that they confirmed judges all throughout 2020 and that the COVID relief that the House passed in May of 2020, that it stayed in the House. Um, Republicans made sure that Americans stayed hungry. They made sure that uninsured um, unemployment benefits uh, did not continue. Uh, they did not do anything effectively to ensure that the Republic went forward. So I think at this point, it is really incumbent on the people that did uh, engage in the vote to make sure that their voices are again raised to let Democrats know make shit happen. That's just where we are. There is no left or right. We, we can't turn around and go back. This is exactly what they were elected to do. They are taxpayer-funded elected people. We hired them to do a job. And this job is to make sure that folks um, have money in their pockets, that they're doing well um, in this uh, pandemic, in these number of crises that they're facing, and that they should be held to that standard. Greg, here's a, what is amazing here. The filibuster is not in the United States Constitution. It is a rule. It is a rule that they created. And it was a rule that was, that, that was frankly, installed by racists. Racists installed it to stop black folks from having rights. So this is an example of Democrats today, Manchin, uh, 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 Simona, whatever name is, and these other people, they are literally defending a Jim Crow tactic. Yeah, they are rolling it as well. They should. They're soft white nationalists, and they know the people that will return them to their elective office are white nationalists. You know, in some ways, in, in deeper oh. structural ways, this is this should be seen as an encouraging development. Uh, the white nationalists are going to break this system. It probably has to be broken. So when we hear um, the assertion that we are defending democracy, you know, we shouldn't say that, not if we have any sense of history. This was inevitable. It was predictable. Uh, what we know, what we knew what was going to happen, we, we knew that white nationalists would eventually in, engage in their last stand. We didn't, you know, we couldn't have predicted necessarily the conflagration points, the, the 20, 2016 to 2020 presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, the, the riot at the Capitol, the white riot. But we certainly know that the restriction of voting rights 
is consistent. That's why folks who thought that Brad Raffensperger was some kind of hero certainly were doing that ahistorically. He is, of course, lined up with the white nationalists in Georgia, from Hancock County to the commission they've now put together, this Georgia State Commission, and he's supporting rolling back rights. So, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we know we knew Joe Manchin. We, we, we've been saying it longer than anybody else. I mean, it's commercial white-facing uh, news entertainment media trying to act like there's some mystery to this. No, we all knew it was going to happen. That hasn't been said. It's time to break their backs, break their entire backs. What does that mean? I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, Vice President Harris went to West Virginia and gave a talk, or gave a talk in West Virginia. Joe's a little mad. Big boy, your back <laughs> can be broken, and it needs to break, because them coal mining jobs ain't coming back, and them people down there suffering that you're willing to give $11 an hour, but not 15 as if that's the difference. They need to rise up and break your political back. But since we're in this moment, and the John Lewis Act has been passed by Congress, and of course, uh, the white nationals out of Kentucky put in his back pocket. You know, don't even stop with that. Go to the For the People Act. Because, see, the For the People Act, which also passed Congress, would require every state to provide online, automatic, and same day registration in federal, uh, uh, federal elections, ensure at least 15 days of in person early voting. That legislation was passed, too. So, Chuck who's going to be primaried and hopefully drilled out of the United States uh, Senate in a couple of years, it's time now to be a man and to either stand up for our common humanity or uh, accelerate what was going to happen anyway, Roland. They were going to break this system because it's the only way they think that they can preserve their white nationalist interests. So and this is what... And this is where the pressure has to be put on them. This is where it has to be constant pressure. This is where uh, folks should be mobilizing, pushing them. Because so, so here's the deal. It's a perfect example. Democrats are in control of the United States Senate. Where's the first bill? See, th 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 this whole deal that you got to wait, well, we got to do COVID first. I I'm just trying to understand, like, literally right now, I've got five projects in. I got five projects going on at one time. Like I literally can't afford to go. No, 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 no. I got to do this one. Then I'm gonna get to the other four. No, I got to do all these right now. And so I don't understand with staff and all this sort of stuff why you cannot have multiple bills operating at one time. It should simply be COVID bill, John Lewis bill, George Floyd Justice Act bill. Those should be the first three bills passed by Congress in the first 30 days. I, 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 I'm just trying to understand, like, what the hell are you waiting on? Let's be real clear. The Republicans are not going, excuse me, the Democrats are not going to get 10 Republican votes, uh, uh, Reese. It's not going to happen. The, the, there are no 10 Republican votes on any of those bills to get. None. You, you can try all you want to. Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, Mitt Romney. Uh, you could say Pat Toomey's retiring. You ain't getting 10. So what you gonna do? No. That is the damn question. I mean, they just barely got the organizing resolution passed, so now you have the Democrats who are controlling the committees. What's the holdup? I don't get it. I know people are gonna say, oh, it's only been so many days. Oh, it's only been so many weeks. All of these things have been in the Congress before. These are not brand new solutions. They're solutions that passed already in the House. Put it back on the floor. Get it going through committees. I don't understand what the holdup is. I mean, there needs to be a lot of urgency about all of these matters. And I, I'm just I'm just really kind of dumbfounded here as to what the strategy is. Because just talking about COVID, okay, that's fine. But that's not stopping you from doing anything else. And if the Republicans are going to filibuster it, put it on the damn floor and let them filibuster it, and then you get rid of the filibuster. But it just seems to me like people are trying to, or the, 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 the Senate Rep Democrats are trying to wait for the right moment or something. They should have put D.C. statehood up there. They should have put, uh, they should have put this, uh, like you said, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, For the People Act, and the um and the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Those those are no brainers right off the top. So I don't know what the hell is going on, but you have the momentum. Yes, you're gonna have the impeachment trial coming up. I, you know whatever with that, but I, I don't get it. I, I, it just seems really weak to me. Well, uh, we certainly see what's gonna happen there right now. What is happening in the United States House? 
uh, Democrats are making their effort when it comes to targeting uh, uh, that nutcase out of Georgia, uh, Congresswoman uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, they are voting to strip her for committee assignments. Why? Well, let's see. She's a racist. She's a bigot. She's an idiot. She's a QAnon supporter. You name it. So, you know what? Before we play her speech, let's just go ahead and roll it. I'm white. I got you, bro. Yeah, if, um, illegally selling water with our permit. On my property. So, earlier today, Marjorie Taylor took to the floor of the U.S. House to plead her case to show everyone that she's a Jesus lover, that she is someone who, oh my goodness, she's just, she just loves the Lord and, and all that sort of stuff along those lines. Actually, before I go to her right now, Congresswoman Lucy McBath is speaking on the floor. Uh, uh, she, uh, she was be on the floor, and so we're going to try to pull her speech. Uh, but before we go back to the floor, uh, if y'all want to just, uh, let's see if your heart has been touched by, by but just the words of now the humbled Marjorie Taylor Greene. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, my Democrat colleagues, Republican colleagues, my district back home in Georgia 14, to the American people, to my mom and dad, and my husband and my children. I've been here for one month and a day, and I've gotten to know part of my uh, conference, my Republican colleagues, but not even all of them yet. I haven't gotten to know any of my Democrat colleagues, and I haven't had to had, have any conversations with any of you to tell you who I am and what I'm about. You only know me by how Media Matters, CNN, MSNBC, and the rest of the mainstream media is portraying me. What you don't know about me is that I'm a very proud wife of almost 25 years, that I'm a mother of three children, and I consider being a mother the greatest blessing of my life and the greatest thing that I'll ever achieve. I'm proudly the first person to graduate college in my family, making my parents very happy and proud. I'm also a very successful business owner. We've grown our company from one state to 11 states. I'm a very hard worker. I've always paid my taxes. I've never been arrested. I've never done drugs, but I've gotten a few speeding tickets in my day. What you need to know about me is I'm a very regular American, just like the people I represent in my district and most people across the country. I never ever considered uh, to run for Congress or even get involved in politics. As a matter of fact, I wasn't a political person until I found a candidate that I really liked and his name is Donald J. Trump when he ran for president. To me, he was someone I could relate to, someone that I enjoyed his plain talk, not, not the offensive things, but just the way he talked normally. And I thought, finally, maybe this is someone that will do something about the things that deeply bother me, like the fact that we're so deeply in debt that our country has murdered over 62 million people in the womb, the fact that our borders are open and some of my friends have had their children murdered by illegal aliens, or perhaps that maybe we can stop sending our sons and daughters to fight in foreign wars and be used as the, as the world's police, basically. Or maybe that our government would stand up for our American businesses and our American jobs and make the American people and the American taxpayers their focus. These are the things that I care about deeply. So when we elected President Trump, and then I started seeing things in the news that didn't make sense to me, like Russian collusion, which are conspiracy theories also and have been proven so, these things bothered me deeply. And I realized just watching CNN or Fox News, I may not find the truth. And so what I did is I started looking up things on the internet asking questions like most people do every day. Use Google. And I stumbled across something, and this was at the end of 2017, called QAnon. Well, these posts were mainly about this Russian collusion information, 
A lot of it was some of what I would see on the news at night, and I got very interested in it. So I posted about it on Facebook. I read about it. I talked about it. I asked questions about it, and then more information came from it. But you see, here's the problem. Throughout 2018, because I was upset about things and didn't trust the government, really, because the people here weren't doing the things that I thought they should be doing for us, the things that I just told you I cared about. And I want you to know a lot of Americans don't trust our government, and that's sad. The problem with that is, though, is I was allowed to believe things that weren't true, and I would ask questions, questions about them and talk about them. And that is absolutely what I regret, because if it weren't for the Facebook post and, and comments that I liked in 2018, I wouldn't be standing here today and you couldn't point a finger and accuse me of anything wrong because I've lived a very good life that I'm proud of, my family's proud of, my husband's proud of, my children are proud of, and my, that's what my district elected me for. So in 20, later in 2018, when I started finding misinformation, lies, things that were not true in these QAnon posts, I stopped believing it. And I want to tell you, any source, and I say this to everyone, any source of information that is a mix of truth and a mix of lies is dangerous no matter what it is saying, what party it is helping, anything or any country it's about. It's dangerous. And these are the things that happen on the left and the right. And it's, it is a true problem in our country. So I walked away from those things and I decided I'm going to do what I've done all my life. I'm going to work hard and try to solve the problems that I'm upset about. So I started getting involved in politics. You see, school shootings are absolutely real. And every child that has lost, those families mourn it. I understand how terrible it is because when I was 16 years old in 11th grade, my school was a gun-free school zone, and one of my schoolmates brought guns to school and took our entire school hostage. And that happened right down the hall from my classroom. I know the fear that David Hogg had that day. I know the fear that these kids have. And this is why, and I say this sincerely with all my heart, because I love our kids, every single one of your children, all of our children. I truly believe that children at school should never be left unprotected I believe they should be just as protected as we were with 30,000 National Guardsmen. Our children are our future and they're our most precious resource. I also want to tell you 9-11 absolutely happened. I remember that day crying all day long watching it on the news. And it's a tragedy for anyone to say it didn't happen. And so that I definitely want to tell you. I do not believe that it's fake. I also want to tell you. I ain't, I'm done listening to her. Bring in the panel. <laughs> now, y'all, what I didn't get to with the part, matter of fact, y'all find it for me. Y'all find it for me when she said, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, uh, and folk make mistakes, and uh, uh, we all sin, and uh, y'all, she was playing that Jesus card real hard. I've been humbled uh, by this, and I've been, uh, mm-hmm. There have been a lot of speeches on the floor today, lighting her ass up. Let me tell you who brought the funk. Steny Hoyer of Maryland. Watch this. I heard about motherhood today. Two of those women, between them have six children. They're mothers. One of them does not have children. And she's come to this body asking for more housing for people, for more health care for people, for more income for people. How awful. 
and they're not the squad. They're Elon. They're Alexandria. And they're Rashida. They are people. They are our colleagues. And yes, you may have disagreements. But I don't know anybody, including Steve King, who you precluded from going on committees for much less. And this is an AR-15 in the hands of Ms. Green. This was on Facebook just a few months ago. That is a message of peace and reconciliation and peaceful democratic dialogue. The squad's worst enemy, AR-15, in hand. Sounds like the guns I fled. I have never, ever seen that before. Mm. Y'all go ahead and play that. I just love Jesus. Opportunity, and I'll tell you why. I believe in God with all my heart, and I'm so grateful to be humbled, to be reminded that I'm a sinner and that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me for my sins. And this is something that I absolutely rejoice in today to tell you all. And I think it's important for all of us to remember none of us are perfect. None of us are. And none of us can even come close to earning our, our way into heaven just by our acts and our works. But it's only through the grace of God. And this is why I will tell you, as a member of this Congress, the 117th Congress, I am a passionate person. I'm a competitor. I'm a fighter. I will work with you for good things for the people of this country. But the things I will not stand for is abortion. I think it's the worst thing this country has ever committed. Mm, abortion is the worst thing this country has ever committed. How about slavery when they rip the babies out of the wombs of black women? See, here's the deal here, uh, Erica, uh, you, you being from Georgia, with this trifling-ass woman right here. Steny Hoyer nailed it. She stood up there and said, I've gotten a chance to know some other Republicans in our conference. I haven't gotten a chance to know the Democrats. They only know me from what they've heard of from media matters and CNN. No, 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 no. Cory Bush know about your ass. Right. Mm -hmm. When you and your staff accosted Congresswoman Cory Bush in the hallway, mm -hmm. forcing her to move. Yo, yo, Jesus loving trifling ass didn't all of a sudden, yeah, you weren't loving the Lord when, when you went off on her. You, you, you wasn't humble and you wasn't a mama and a loving wife and a Christian when all that was happening. But now they want to jack your sorry country ass. Now you want to do, and, I, and earlier today, y'all, I was on with David Brody. And, and he, and, and David, you know, David, you know, look, that good guy, we had a great conversation. And, you know, David felt that I wasn't extending, you know, the <laughs> compassion to her uh, that was needed. And, and you know, uh, being a Christian, I was like, but I said, bro, I said, let, let me help you out with that. I said, first of all, let me be real clear. I said, Married to a minister, I'm a Christian author. I said, oh, I know the word. I said, but see, what y'all can't handle is that what she did today is what that German theologian who studied mm. at Abyssinian Baptist Church, who got a taste of liberation theology and mm. took that back to Germany when they were mm. fighting Hitler. Y'all, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Well, that German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, laid out a concept called cheap grace. And <laughs> cheap grace is when folk like her stand there with their white tears, speaking mm. about their white Christianity, asking for forgiveness, yeah. when knowing full well 
tomorrow you gonna go back to doing what you were doing before. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. When you go to God and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm sorry, then you will hold a day and then you turn around and you start a hoeing tomorrow, but then you want to ask God for forgiveness about your hoeing tomorrow. And then when you hold tomorrow, you ask God for forgiveness and you turn around and you hold back on Saturday and Sunday. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about the people who do that. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Back to hoeing. Lord, forgive me. Back to being a freak. Lord, forgive me. Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. That is what she think we just going to sit here and uh, accept. No, not happening. <laughs> and um, from Matthew 7, 21 through 23, um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons? in your name and do mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is exactly mm -hmm. who Marjorie Green is to her fucking core. Don't put my Lord and Savior's name in your mouth as a way to excuse the shit that you do on a daily, uh, on a daily basis. My big mama said something to me years and years ago, and it has stuck with me. She said, when you open your mouth, you remove mm -hmm. all doubt. All she is is a racist. When mm -hmm. I was in uh, on the coast, um, which I know many of us have talked about in Ghana, and I stood in the dungeons and looked up and saw where white people were having church while my mm -hmm. ancestors were chained butt naked in a dungeon mm -hmm. about to leave their country on a uh, on, on a gross, gross um, um, uh, journey through the, um, through, through the transit, um, the, through the Atlantic. And I can't even, I'm, I'm so angry. I am so angry because I'm tired, y'all. We have got to engage now. And I'm saying that because folks like Marjorie, that she is under the umbrella of blamelessness. So she'll always be blameless. She's a white woman, so she'll always be blameless. That right. speech fell exactly where it um, should have, on the floor. It has no power. What we have to do is understand that these folks are being trained, they're being donated to, they're giving space to actually occupy these spaces, have these committee spaces, because folks in power understand that they need other people to continue on their work of oppression. So this is what we have to do. It's not just during election time. This type of civic engagement is something that we have to be prepared to do every day of the week. Republicans are always grooming the next Marjorie. They're always mm. grooming the next Mitch McConnell. Where Hello. are our Cory Bushes? Where are our Ayanna Presley? Where are more of our Madam President Kamala mm. Desi Harris? Those are the folks that we need to be training up to assume power to let them know, no, 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 no. What you will do is you will be a member of Congress. You're going to be in Senate. You're going to be in the House of Representatives. That is the type of training that we need to have uh, and that we need to uh, focus on if we expect to make sure that we retain any semblance of democracy, not only just now, but for the years that are to come. Because Marjorie, that type of person, they're going to continue to roll those out left and right. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's actually go to the, let's go uh, in a second. Give me one second. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, the vote uh, has been taken. Go. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. With that objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, it is with a heavy heart that, Madam Speaker, can I ask for the House to be brought into order? The House is not in order. Yeah. Madam Speaker, it is with a heavy heart that I rise to honor the lives of two fallen FBI agents, Daniel Alfin and Laura Schwarzenberger. On Tuesday morning, while so the House is actually voting right now, uh, and I I, the, the time is up. I'm not sure if it's extended, uh, but right now it's uh, 230, uh, 230 votes, 11 Republicans. Uh, Reese voted with the Democrats to strip her of her committee assignment. And they still ain't shit right along with her. So, <laughs> that's fine. 
uh, uh, Erica just preached the whole word, so let me just start right there. And I, I just have to say, listen, this is who they are. This is not, you know, uh, you know, she sat up there and still was talking shit about all kind of stuff. She was doubling down on all kind of stuff. She does not love all our children. She's sitting up there, you know, the reason why she's there is because she was attacking white kids. Okay, let's be clear about that. Not because she was going after Ayanna, I mean, uh, Ileana, rep of Congresswoman Ileana Omar or Rashida Tlaib. It's because she went after David Hogg and her and his sister. And that is appalling. It's disgusting. Okay? So she deserves to get all this stuff stripped. She is a truther about all this other kind of stuff. She wanted to deflect blame. Lady, you are 46 years old. You too damn old to be sitting mm. up there acting like you ain't know no better. <laughs> oh, I was on Facebook. Oh, I was on Google. I don't say that. I'm not going to say the B word on your show, but I will say motherfucker, please. Okay, you was all <laughs> up in there, uh, all into it. It got you to the to the Congress, and now you want people to get to know who you are, girl. Bye. Period. Right. Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Greg, what's what what's a trip? First of all, all these Republicans stand up there. And 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 like the P, I, again the interview I did earlier, they was like, you know, you know what, like our flight should be tweeted this, you know, this is going to set a precedent, and Republicans, if they get control of the House, they're going to go after Maxine Waters, and I tweeted back, try it. I know that's the truth. Try it and see what's going to happen. See, hmm. the, what they can't stay, and this is why I said to David, I said, David, it's real simple. If Kevin McCarthy did what he was supposed to do. Democrats would not have had to do this. Democrats didn't strip uh, Steve King of his committee assignments. Republicans did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they got so much... Pre his, white, his white supremacy got so much for them, they were like, okay, that's just too much white supremacy. So, like, we'll take a little bit. We'll take, like, a, <laughs> we'll take like a, a, a hunk of it. But you just gave us a whole mound of it. We can't take all that. And so, th this whole deal here is... And then the, reason, the reason the vote's important... Because you need to see who is being truthful. Now, see, when they had a vote in the Republican caucus, they wanted to boot Liz Cheney out of leadership. It was a secret vote. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think 61 voted against her and like 190 supported her. All right? But it was a secret vote. And all the people were saying was, see, there you go. If things were taken in secret, you know, a lot of these Republicans, uh, 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 they wouldn't be standing with Trump. No, 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 no. That's why it shouldn't be in secret. Because, see, you show how punk ass you are when in secret you sit here and do one thing, but in public you do another. And when that woman stood there and said, I just didn't know better. I know. But then after I found out the truth, I, I stopped posting and liking that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And you ain't no damn martyr. You ain't no martyr. Well, I don't know, Roland. She might be. She will be if she's drummed out. She'll be a martyr for Okay, well, day. go ahead and get her some Robert E. Lee statues. Go ahead. <laughs> well, no, the reason I say it is because remember when she won that 14th congressional district election, the guy she defeated, the doctor, uh, John Cowan, his campaign slogan was all the conservative, but none of the embarrassment. He said, I, yeah, I believe what she believes in terms of my values, but I'm not going to embarrass you. So here's the thing. I think we have a fundamental. Said it. Oh, I agree with Trump. Well, well, not the, not, 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 not the other stuff. Right. No, but, no, baby, you got to take that with it. Well, 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 see, and, and Roland, see, that, 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 that you've just put your finger on it. There it is right there, brother. There it is. Now, people have been asking, you know, what what changed in, during Trump? Nothing. But what changed after January 6th is this. The line now is bright. We always knew where the line was. Yep. We draw the line because we got off the show. But now you've got to pick. And and, and Erica says, you know, you write recently. She preached the whole word. My thing is this, because like I said, I've stood there at Elmina and looked at the grave there, Jacobus Capitan, the African they had on their side as they blessing the boats. The, the, the fundamental thing, I think, is that when the white nationalist says Jesus and you say Jesus, you're not talking about the same God. That's right. See, and mm -hmm. see this, this, this is the problem. So even, 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 even Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. I mean, even, you know, all, 
when they're talking about cheap grit, that's an internal conversation for them. Because I promise you that if Jesus come out of my mouth, nowhere in my DNA am I speaking about anything that woman is praying to. Right. My God Hallelujah. is fight for God wherever God's fight. That You mm-hmm. understand right. Nat Turner. Because Nat Turner said I had a vision of black angels and white angels fighting. These people... Are not. I go to David Walker, 1829, David Walker's appeal. You go to them, you say, are you a Christian? They say yes. You say, is slavery uh, 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 ungodly? They say yes. You ask them, are you going to let me go? If they say hmm. no, then they are not, in fact, with God, but they are the devil. And you have now hmm. been authorized to end your condition of servitude by any means necessary. That's 1829. This man called himself a Christian. Okay. Let's be very clear about this. The, Repub- the I say the Republican Party, but they're really the white nationalist party. When she was in that primary that put her in, she got th- thousands of dollars from Jim Jordan's House Freedom Fund. She got thousands of dollars from Mark Meadows' uh, uh, PAC. And, his, uh, and she got thousands of dollars from Coke Industries. Let's be very clear. Mm-hmm. And when she won the primary, the mm-hmm. white nationalists in Georgia, knowing full well who she was, sent her to the federal legislature. Let's be clear and tied to what Ari was talking about, Roland, when you interviewed him. These white boys. These white nationalists have dropped all pretenses. When they passed the law that you're going to talk about later on in Wisconsin, that's the first COVID legislation they passed in 10 months, and it was to drop the mask mandate. When they filed 108 bill changes in the past month and a half or so to try to overturn voting rights, they have declared all-out war, and they're going to stand with their God, and I love them for it. Why? Because the, their God, their Jesus, is the God of the Ku Klux Klan, mm, onward yes. so yes. But when you Preach stand it. in the battlefield, anybody who tolerates it, anybody who acts this is a country with democracy and we must somehow find a way to heal and work together, you are standing with the devil. And that authorizes That's the right. rest of us to do whatever we need to do to end our condition of servitude. That's it. There are only two sides. January 6th settled it. Anybody? You pick? And let's fight. And see that. See that's why. That's why we don't play footsie here. No. Okay. See you. You can't. You can't sit here and talk about. I care about all constituents, and uh, uh, Joe Biden. You know you're not really practicing unity. You're not doing these things, and I'm like, no, hold, hold up. Y'all supporting that. See, Mm -hmm. you can't sit here, Kevin McCarthy, give a speech on the floor, Mm. calling Trump out for his role in the insurrection. But then you vote against the impeachment. Mm -hmm. Then you fly your ass down to Florida and take a picture with him. That's right. As because really what you're saying is, I, I I I know what I said on the floor was one thing, mm-hmm. but 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 the picture says I, I'm I'm really with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See that that's why that's why when when I was with David, David was like, well, do, do, do you not accept her, uh, uh, her her apology? I'm like, hell no. Y'all go ahead and take <laughs> this. Take this. <laughs> Action to that from Roland Martin, a host and managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered. Roland, great to have you back on the show. Great to be back. What's happening? All right, well, we got a lot happening, and and but I want to play. We're going to play in a moment some of Marjorie Taylor Greene's comments on the House floor first. But I want to get your overall view of Democrats taking this vote because this is unprecedented for for a Democrat for an opposition party to say we're not having any of this. Well, if the Republicans had done their job, this wouldn't be left up to Democrats. Uh, That was the problem there. This is an absolutely crazy and deranged woman. That's who she is. And so, sure, her crazy constituents in Georgia elected her, but so did those fools in Iowa who elected Steve King. Republicans took the steps against him. But when you look at not just her... See, Kevin McCarthy, oh, but her comments before. No, no, no. It's what she has said shit since she's been there. And then I, I, I really get a kick out of folk who have a long track record of comments and all of a sudden, oh, I denounce what I said. Hell, you said it. 
Yeah, but okay, but Roland, here's the thing. We can we can play the duplicity card. I mean, can I bring up Ilan Omar? Can I bring up Maxine Waters? Can I bring up some folks that have said some Try crazy it. stuff too? Some crazy stuff too. Try it. Try I, it. But also, did any of them try to lead an insurrection? Did any of them tweet 1776? I, did any of them talk about that? I'm just, Marjorie Green cannot be trusted as a member of Congress. Pure okay. and simple. And here's the deal. Do the rules allow for this to happen? Yes, they do. Republicans supposedly like playing by the rules, right? Roland, I want you to listen to Marjorie Taylor Greene. She was on the House floor today. We're going to all watch it together. Here it is. And I want you to know. A all lot right, of so I played. I I I, I played that, and I'm gonna let that go ahead uh, and play. Uh, y'all get ready to go back when y'all see when y'all see us come back. Just going back. Uh, but and again, I, I like David, and I get it. He's speaking to his uh, his right audience. But I'm gonna bring that heat so they can actually hear the truth. And I'm mm -hmm. not playing that that look that that look that look again that look Christian love game that she thought. I mean, I, I'm the wrong one. Mm -mm, no, nah, boo, that 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 dog don't hunt where I come from. Uh, it, it it's just not gonna work. <laughs> and see, and and let's just be real clear: you got too many folk on mainstream TV who's scared to say it, who's scared no, to right. actually go there, who don't want to mm -hmm. truly call out white Christianity, who don't want to call out white nationalism. They want to use all the other words and phrases uh, around it. Mm -hmm. Nah, see, we're not gonna sit here. Uh, and dance around it. We're going to call this thing exactly what it is, and they have to get checked. Uh, they have to get called out, and it's not just folk like her. It is Marco Rubio. It is Jim. Uh, can y'all keep that thing down about wrestlers being sexually assaulted, Jordan? Mm -hmm. uh, it's all the rest of these folk uh, who want to play uh, all of these games. And see, we're going to do a roll call. Because, see, I'm telling you, as Greg said it, I've been telling y'all, it's only two lines. Either you were with the folks on January 6th or you with the rest of us. See, we, 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 we ain't going to play hopscotch. Yes, yeah, ain't gonna hop right. over here. They come over here. They come over here. You know, I, I don't want to hear you talking about unity. If you stand with those thugs, those white domestic terrorists, mm -hmm. or even the confused, yeah. ignorant black folks and other dark-skinned folks who were with them, then you know what? You, you as well. Go back to David Brody. Roland, Roland don't laugh. None of no. us are perfect. I'm a sinner. Words of the past. It was a mea culpa. It was a mea culpa. It was an apology. That's what you're going to get. That, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, Roland. Roland. You, you, you actually fail for that? You, you what? actually... Well, I look, mean, look, so, so look, now we're not I, supposed look, to believe I, anybody? I, look, I... Do you actually believe what she just said? Listen, I, I, you was believe led I was led astray by things at the time that I didn't realize were not true. Now I have seen the light, and now they are true. Rowan, is she Bro, the first person in the world on. to do a mea culpa? She's not the first person to do I'm a mea culpa. But no, no, no. I understand the difference between a mea culpa and then somebody who's like, yeah, I need to save my behind. I still believe that stuff, but I got to so say Democrats, the right thing. So Democrats have never done that? I mean, come on. Liberals, liberals haven't nothing, done that? I believe nothing that she just said. Nothing. And then I'm a, love, I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. I'm a... Come on, Don't, David. David. Wait, Roland, don't get know. on her faith now. You're starting to condemn her faith David. now. No, 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 I'm not. Because first of all, David, you got to remember who you're talking to. The husband of an ordained minister. A Christian yeah, author. So, so I, also, I also understand when theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace. Yeah, but you okay? don't know her. You, talk, you, you don't know her. You don't know no, her. No, 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 no. Here's, here's what I, again. You don't know See, her. again, if we want to have a Christian conversation, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about those people who have cheap grace, who do things and they go, oh, Lord, forgive me. They go back to doing these things. I, all, I Here's judge my Marjorie Taylor Greene. Hold up. I judge her based upon what she has said since she got elected. And she has hey. said absolutely crazy, outrageous things. Not 2018, hey. 2020, 2021. Roland, straight up. Liberals always talk about compassion for your fellow man. And then and then you got th this going on. Look, why can't we have some compassion for her? I mean, in other, when I say oh, compassion, no, no, no. I, forgiveness, no, no, no. forgiveness. What compassion. about forgiveness? Here's the deal. I can have compassion All right. and still remove still remove your behind from your committees. And then in <laughs> six months, and no, no, no. In six months, when we actually see if you've actually changed, then they can be restored. But but see, here's the deal. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't do all the things she said and done in the past few months, including January 6th, and then go, oh, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. No, nah, boo. That's well, not how it li works. Listen, no, Roland, I disagree with you. She can say that 
and then show in the future if she doesn't make the same mistake, if you will. But the point, nah. but, but she can say it. She can say it. She can say it. Here's the deal. Democrats take the action, and in six months, if she actually shows what she just talked about, they can always restore. So can that you'd happen? be for that. Can you'd that be, happen? You'd be for that. You'd be for her restore, getting the committee assignments back if she showed true contrition. If she shows it, but let's see what she says and does for the next six months. I don't trust that she actually can we, be humbled and not act a fool for the next six months. But sure, let's see what happens. We, but snatch the committee right now. Will you at least acknowledge that this is not just a conservative QAnon issue? This is the liberals do this on the other side too. Everybody's got their baggage, uh, Roland. Everybody's got their no, no, baggage. No, no. Individuals have their baggage. Yes, yes. And here's and here's the deal. And here's the deal. This is real simple, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I, all I heard for the last four years from Republicans yeah. is that winning, uh, right. you actually have the spoils of victory. Well, guess what? Yeah. What happens when you win? Roland Martin. I'm going to say this on national television. I love you, and there's no air quotes around that. You know I that. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. See, I ain't making excuses for these folks. You're a better man than I am. <laughs> see, you know, see, <laughs> see, my deal is I knew exactly. See, again, <laughs> game recognized game. See, they, they, they love, because see, here's the deal. Here's the deal. They want you to go chase that rabbit hole. Democrats said this. This is me. Mm-mm. Mm -mm, we, ain't, we ain't going there. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. We ain't going there. We ain't going there. We're going to stay right here. See, Erica, that, that's the real deal here. And see, and what I need folk to understand is, again, it's only two sides now. If you align in any way with them white domestic terrorists on January 6th, you are my mm. enemy. You mm. are my people's enemy. We, we, mm. we, we ain't sitting here. But, and that's why I was like, all right, mm. all them words, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. Let me see what you do for the next six months. Mother. But here's what we already know. She's already sent a fundraising appeal lying on AOC. Yeah. Yeah. So, Heffa, you already showed me who you are. Come on. Yes, you already raising money and you lied on AOC in your fundraising appeal. That's why snatch your committee. Yeah, and snatch your wig while you're at it. Um, I got to give a <laughs> shout out to Greg. He gave me my life back in a text message just that quickly because it, it, it you, you personalize this, right? Um, it, it just really the apologist kind of narrative that continues to flow out of uh, a whiteness. But this is why we have to stay vigilant. You know, I know you've already discussed this um, on the show earlier this week, but we're thinking about, you know, the lack of grace, the lack of understanding that was not given to a nine-year-old black child in Rochester, mm. New York. And so mm. we see how there's always a runway, right, for whiteness <clears throat> to be considered uh, otherwise, to um, you don't know what's in their heart. Well, you know, the Bible clearly says the heart is is, is vile. It's, it's full of <laughs> things that are not pleasing <laughs> unto God. So, you know, scratch that, like throw that all the way out of the window. We know who she is because she told us who she was. She told us who she was when she was running for office. And when she got into office, she continued to tell us who she was. She said that she engaged in politics because she was drawn by the son of a Klansman. And I continue to say he's the son of a Klansman because we okay. have to always go back to what the Klans, uh, what the Klan uh, was founded on. And Dr. Carr laid it out for us. They were founded on some type of Christian um, belief system, but it was not, it's not a belief system that extends to all people. It is very much so narrow and centers and upholds and, and makes sure that the, the uh, supremacy is always with whiteness. Everyone else is there to serve whiteness. And so as we think about this and as we continue to hear the media talk about her um, ad nauseum, as we continue to hear QAnon become more mainstream, that we continue to hold true to who she and the Republican Party is. What we saw on January the 6th is really the outflow of what the natives and what black people have experienced in this very nation by white uh -huh. mobs. It has always been like this for us. It has That's always right. been like this for natives. We are the ones who built this damn thing. So understand that Marjorie Green ain't shit, but another uh, copy out of this whole um, prototype 
of how you aggressively attack, oppress, suppress all voices that are non-white. That is all it is. And so if there cannot be um, some type of courage gained by the Democrats out, outflowed from all of the black folk, 90% um, of black people, excuse me, of black women, 80% of black men that made their way to the polls to make sure that they were in power in the, in the, the White House, uh, in both chambers of Congress, then we have a real issue here. Mm. What, we got see, the wrong people in power. See, Reese, what, what they want us to do, they want us to play the go along, get along mm. with this fallacy that, no, 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 that's not me. See, what I keep trying to explain to people, <laughs> when you show your racism and your bigotry, you don't show that wearing a hood. Mm -hmm. You don't show that burning a cross. Mm -hmm. right. You don't show that hurling the N-word. <clears throat> you do it when you defend those who do. You do it when you pass laws that are specifically tailored at black people. You mm -hmm. do it when you stand up and 140 House Republicans mm -hmm. vote not to accept the electors from one of four or five states because really you're saying black people, it was your votes. See, mm -hmm. they didn't contest the white votes. Right. When the white Republican in, North, in Michigan said, oh, well, let's certify all the votes in Michigan except Detroit. Mm -hmm. We know what you're saying, boo. Mm. We know what right. you're saying. And if y'all go along with her, your raggedy mm. asses go along with bigotry. Absolutely. I mean, this is the same party that basically made the case over 60 times that black people, Latino people, Native American people are second class citizens, that we should don't, we don't even deserve full enfranchisement. We don't deserve full citizenship. And then you got the damn nerve to act like we supposed to uh, let this woman sit on these committees. Hell no. Bye, Ashy. Period. <laughs> and, you know, it's nothing more than the media loves is to rehabilitate the image of a white nationalist, the white supremacist, uh, 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 oh, I, I'm so sorry, I'm just a little innocent little white lady, even though you were sitting up there armed, harassing two mm. white kids after they were all, they were up there to do what she said she came to Washington to do, which is to make change, to advocate for themselves, and she's sitting up there uh, hounding them with a weapon. She's lucky there was no black mama around, because it would have been a better situation. That. You know, they say monkey know which tree to climb, and she knew which tree to climb on that day, but now look at her because now she done got stripped. But, Roland, I do want to say one thing, though, because it's, it's a little off topic, but I'm sure tonight, and this is no shade, I'm sure tonight that Don Lemon is going to go viral for some, you that? know, mild mm. rebuke, and he's going to say on, some words. Come on, and, you come know, on, that's cool. I like Don. I ain't got no problem. I ain't got no beef with Don. But... Let's keep it real. This is where the real is. And okay. another thing I just wanted to say is the NAACP Image Awards came out. And what I want to say, too, again, we talked about this last week, about how Black people can validate other Black people, how we are the trendsetters. And I just noticed in the news category, it was no Black media, Black-owned media people that were recognized. It was all, you know, CNN special, MSNBC special, <laughs> or whatever the situation is. Red table talk. And, and I like all those people. Don't get me wrong. It's no shade to any of them. But when we start to validate ourselves and the stuff that we're doing, and we start to look beyond what the mainstream is doing and saying, okay, we're only going to pull from the pool of mainstream white, you know, um, white, uh, comforting media, you know, then maybe we could get somewhere on our own, too. Because we got a lot of work to do in ourselves and empowering ourselves. Like uh, Erica said, like Dr. Carson, like you said, Roland, the Marjories are going to be the Marjories, okay? That's, they got the Karens, they got the Marjories, they got the Jims, and all of these folks. But we got we to gotta get ourselves together. We got to start recognizing our own power, and we got to start yeah. 
validating ourselves and recognizing that, and then maybe that will push us even further. Well, and and look, um, right. we, um, just so folks know, um, we, you know, the first two, the first two Image Awards ever won by TV One, um, I won. The first two in their history. Uh, it was for first the Barack Obama special, the second one was for the Michelle Obama special. Uh, then, um, then um, the first two years, the NAACP created a category called Best Host. The first two years that category existed, um, I won those first two years. And then um, we were not nominated the last three years. We were not on the last three years. Um, not nominated for this show each year. Um, and it, it, it was interesting because I'm the same guy. Yeah. Now, I'm not with TV One, but I'm literally the same guy. So I won Best Host the first two years. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith won Best Host the last two years. Um, I was the one who, she, she wasn't there. I actually was the one who sent her a text, told her she won. I told her, said, we tied two and two, so we'll see who breaks the tie uh, next year. And so when the nominations came out, she's nominated again, uh, not nominated. And um, you're absolutely right when you decide to be black on, when you decide to cover the issues, when you decide to do those things. And for everybody out there to understand, um, what we what we put up for our special uh, was our Chadwick Boseman tribute. Mm. That's what we put up. Yes, sir. I okay. don't know. I mean, and so again, we could have picked from the Joseph Lowry. We could have picked from the John Lewis, any of those. But we put up the Chadwick Boseman three-hour special that we did. Uh, and this is a photo uh, in my house there uh, you'll see of um, of those awards right there. Uh, and that's the four Image Awards. That's the Hank Aaron uh, Award, the NABJ Journalist of the Year. Uh, and also, when Colin Kaepernick sent me the jersey, this came with it. And so I went ahead and uh, put that right there as well. <laughs> so, and so the thing is this here, uh, what I said to some folk, uh, we gonna keep doing what we do because the reality is uh, I've never needed white validation, nor have I ever mm. needed black validation. Mm. No, but, I, but 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 it is but it is important for us when we do understand that uh, how we recognize our own because we see we do this 365. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. See, yes, sir. Uh, I don't pop in and pop out. Um, you know, I, I don't see here all of a sudden. I ain't never all of a sudden discovered my blackness. Mm. I, mm. I, 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 I never I never had you know an epiphany where all of a sudden. Uh, n n no one has ever said where did Roland's boldness all of a sudden come from. It came the day I got hired. Mm -hmm. So you know that's why we do what we do. See that's the, see that's why that's why and, and I said it. I mean there's a reason why uh, these black mainstream show hosts don't invite me. Sure. Mm -hmm. But when they books come out, they sure call me. When oh. they get in trouble. They want me to tweet support for them, mm. and, and and that's just how folk folk do. Mm. Um, mm. And just for everybody to understand, um, for everybody out there to understand, I need y'all to, to to understand this here. My validation mm. comes when a brother picked me up the Uber driver the other day, and I had the mask on. And the brother was like, oh, man, this is this, when, I, when I took the, the Roro Mobile in to get serviced. He said, man, this is a nice vehicle. What you do? And he said, he said, what? Because he, he, he knew my name because he said he had it on the phone. He's like, Roland, what you do? And then I took it off. He went, oh, Roland, Roland. <laughs> yes, sir. He like, oh. Yes, sir. It's on the drive, you. See, that that's... That's 
The validation. No the validation is when I'm on the street corner and I was talking to somebody and literally 30 folk buses and taxi cab drivers drove by honking. And the woman was out talking to she's like, damn, she said, is there a parade or something out there? I said, hey, there's black people driving by. And that's just, <laughs> and that's just what it boils down to. And so um, the thing that we are also going to do, because I want to talk to you all about this here, because we had the subject on yesterday. And we go, I'm going to bring in the COVID piece to tie it into it. We had Wendell Pierce on yesterday talking about the Black Media Coalition they created in New Orleans. Yeah. Mm. And we're dealing right now with a fundamental problem in this country when it comes to the COVID vaccine. My mm. CFO called me today to say she and her mama and another relative went to a Walmart on 119th Street in Chicago. For mm. anybody who ain't from Chicago, that's like to Chicago. deep, <laughs> deep south side. Yes, no, it is. That, that ain't like Bronzeville south side. That ain't 32nd, 35th, 40th. Nah. It's nah. 119th. Damn, damn near Chicago land. You, are, you ain't yeah. in Chicago. No. <laughs> she told yeah. me that there were <laughs> 10 black people in line a handful of Hispanics, and everybody else was white. Mm. And so here we're dealing with a COVID issue. Black folks not trusting it, but also black folks not even knowing where to go. So mm -hmm. I've been raising the question to CBC members, to the Biden administration, okay, who got the contract to handle public engagement in media for COVID? And is there a black ad agency mm. that's a part of that who knows where to go to the black people? Mm -hmm. And see, I already know how the agencies think. So they figure, well, we gonna go find some black celebrities. But the data, mm -hmm. the data shows that black people, only 7% of black people listen to black celebrities to make major decisions that affect their lives. That mm -hmm. means 93% don't. So y'all can go get all the rappers and the singers and the actors you want, and there's no disrespect to any of them, but right. that's not who they're listening to. Nope. Thirdly, nope. and this is why I'm bringing up mainstream media, mm. since, February, since March of 2020, We've done more than we've done more than 100. Y'all get that commercial ready for the commercial break. We've done more than 100 different segments on this show, mm. specifically about black people and COVID, mm -hmm. featuring black experts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, what you're talking about, Reese, is critically important. But here's what I prefer: they can keep the image award. I want the $25 million advertising. How about that? I heard that. I want the 50 that? million. I, 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 I want the 100 million. Because that? I want to be able to hire 10, 25, 30, 40, 50, 65, 75 reporters. And mm -hmm. see, and just so I said last night, just so folks don't, don't know I'm not playing on this, Greg, I said mm -hmm. last night, we're going to put up 100000 to go hire a writer to focus specifically on how black media is getting screwed out of advertising dollars, and we're going to put some folk on Front Street mm. in the government and the private sector. Come on. Because, you see, need yeah. what people need to understand is that when you choke off the ad money, mm. and mm. then you then choke off the black ad agencies... Then when you choke off the black ad agencies, you choke off the black media. Then yes, when you sir. choke off black media, you then choke off the unfiltered information flow to black people. Right. And then when you choke off the unfiltered information flow to black people, then you suffocate black people with mm. mainstream drivel or gossip and entertainment coming from black targeted sources. Mm. And so right. then we are walking around looking like zombies in the movie, Us. Brother. Mm. 
And that's Which what we are sitting here trying to for. fight. Greg, go ahead. That's right. No, I was going to say, I mean, Roland, what you just what you just broke down, brother, is really at, at the end of the day, a conversation about black institutions. The NAACP was not founded as a black institution. From its birth, there has been a tension between its local branches and the national because it's driven by this, brother. Yeah, this is right here. The dollar bill. I had to go find one. This dollar bill. <laughs> it's driven by this, brother. See, this is this is Booker T. Washington. People talking about Harriet Tubman. He was on a coin at one time. Or more importantly, the image awards may be driven a little bit more by this. Pennies on the dollar. Why? <laughs> because when you look at who's nominated, and I'm looking at these white publishers pushing their books, and you know, I read everything. So I read all those books and I just laugh every time the Image Award lists the books that have been nominated. I don't see the books. I see the publishers that wrote the check for the fundraiser. When mm -hmm. I see the films that have been nominated, I don't see the films. I see the companies that wrote the check for the fundraiser. When I see mm -hmm. the host and shows, I don't see that. The thing that changed was you're not a TV one anymore. Individuals don't beat institutions. But here's the thing. And what you just break, wrote down is very important. And that's why you're always talking about Ebony Magazine. That's why you work with the Chicago Defender, Randy Defender. When you own your own thing, and when you talked to Wendell Pierce last night, man, it moved me so greatly to listen to that conversation. The people then fund you, and that advertising, see, there used to be black businesses that could fund black media. And once mm -hmm. that assault and that erosion that you walked us through happened, we are now left with this. A handful like Time Magazine, next week's Time Magazine is going to have Amanda Gorman on the front and my old classmate Ibram Kendi, who's got a book out that they slapped together in One World Publishing and selling, 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 selling. And all the response I see is from white people. Why? Because that's who's going to buy it. And half of them ain't going to pick up the book. Go see what happened with How to Be Anti-Racist or White Fragility. They bought books by the hundreds of thousands and left them in the bookstores. They were doing that, you know, cosplay activism after George Floyd's death. <laughs> but the, the cover of next week's Time Magazine got Gorman on the front. And an essay by Ibram Kennedy talked about this is the period of the new black renaissance. Nah, bruh. Let me, let, me, let me help you with this, young brother. Let me help you with this. Time Magazine is not black-owned. Getting a few, hey, look at us. It's like putting a few earrings on a, on a pig. Why? Because as our people are worried about eviction, as our people are worried about COVID, then, you know, sprinkling a few black accoutrements on the front cut of, of, of white magazines is about market share, it's about marketing, and it's about keeping this white supremacist hierarchy going just a little bit longer by letting three Negroes in the room, putting one on the cover and saying, see, we're not that bad. The question that must be raised... The one Pete Seeger wrote a song back in the 60s where they sang it in the Civil Rights and went based on what happened in Kentucky. That's right, Mitch McConnell. Kentucky in 1931, which started the Harlan County Wars, was when they busted those poor white people working in the coal mines and wouldn't pay them. And they went on strike and they sent the police out to break their backs. A white woman asked a question, a simple question that years later became a song. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? This is a white supremacist capitalist society. And when they giving out image awards to people based on who is going to write the biggest check to, check to keep the NAACP going, you know who that's an indictment of? I don't blame the leadership of the NAACP. I blame black people for not supporting black institutions and then not having the sense to understand what you just said, which is when you see the award system, the NAACP Image Awards has now been pulled into a hierarchy that is, that's not even the thing y'all want. You know what you're dreaming of? You know what you're dreaming of? You're dreaming of a golden globe. You're dreaming of an mm. Academy Award. You're dreaming of your master's voice, just like that damn dog sitting in front of that Victrola project on the RCA. You're listening for your master's voice. And see, this is not what Roland Martin and Filthit is doing. And guess what? You're going to keep getting the image award from all the people in the street because them Negroes never listen to the master's voice. And they're the only reason we can free enough to have this conversation right now. So go on and give them awards. Go on and put people on top of the cover of Time magazine. We're not paying attention and we won't be distracted. See, Erica, and I've, mm -hmm. said, I've said this here. Um, I have had three different publicists send information out to all of these media writers, to all of these publications, you can name them, showing the success of this show, showing how it was organically built, showing how in the middle of a pandemic, a black-owned, 
feisty, small digital company <laughs> was profitable. Mm -hmm. Not a single one will write a story. Mm. But I'll see a story about somebody doing a deal with another media company and they launching this whole deal. I see all this coverage. <laughs> I see, and, 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 and the thing is, I've been engaged in these conversations with people, fighting, talking about, trying to get advertising dollars, trying to get people to understand this whole deal. And a lot of these black media folks been silent as well. And in fact, earlier today, I was dealing with some people about this, even this whole deal with COVID. And I was trying to get them to understand. I said, y'all, 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 y'all focus on the wrong thing. You got to follow the money. Right, right. If, 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 if all they are doing is saying, we're going to spread around a million, million, two hundred, two million dollars to all the black groups, to all the black churches, but 30% mm. of the medical workers who have died are black? Mm. Mm. When we're disproportionately dying because of COVID? And you think y'all about to spend $500 million? And we only gonna get two. See, I'm purposely walking people through. See, I took offense, and, and, and when the, the folks at the Neiman Reports dropped this story right here, called "Meet the New Black Press." <laughs> what? I, 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 I took offense to it, and again, I, they had people in the story who, and people who I know, and it's all good. And, and I know the sister who wrote the story, but the reason the new black press is changing the lenses of victimization and dysfunction into lenses of empowerment and agency. See, the reason I had to sit here and take offense to that because they listed the Grio, okay, Zora. I love Vanessa DeLuca, but Zora is not black owned. Come on, brother. Come um, on, break it down. The undefeated. Kevin Merritt is my boy. I, I I know many of their writers. That's ESPN. That's Disney. That ain't mm. black owned. Mm. Um, then they listed some other. The Root. The Root mm. was started by Skip Gates, but The Root is owned by a white hedge fund company, GO Media. Before that, they were owned by Univision. They not black owned. Then uh, Outlier Media, it right there. Though Outlier Media doesn't identify as black press per se, Candace Fortman, the outlet's chief of engagement and operations, acknowledges that serving low wealth information in a nearly 80% black community means that race does matter. Well, first of all, if you can't identify as black press, you ain't black press. <laughs> and then the plug, Okay, they are, uh, they are, I believe they're black, they're, uh, they're black owned. Then, you know, I go down, Blavity, uh, Blavity, black owned. You know, then I see this, this other, here's why, and, and, and I reached out to him and I said, here's why I took offense. I said, the phrase, the black press is specifically talking about black newspapers. Right. And then when you hear people talk about legacy, Legacy, legacy media. I know what they're talking about. In fact, NNPA is called the Black Press of America. Hmm. And see, if you can't identify, if you do not come out of the lineage, come on, brother, of Freedom's Journal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If anybody on this list cannot recite the quote in the March sixteenth, eighteen twenty-seven edition mm -hmm. of Freedom's Journal. Mm -hmm. If I say Samuel Cornish and John Rustworm and you have no idea who I'm talking about. Mm. If I say A.I. Scott and the Land Daily World and I say the Pittsburgh Courier and I say oh. Robert Abbott and the Chicago Defender. Yes, sir. And if I say Louis Martin and the Michigan Chronicle. And John Sinstack, if I say any of those folks and you ask me who, you Come will on, never be able to identify as black press. Come on, brother. Carlotta Bass and the California Eagle, the black women too. Ida B. Wells. What y'all talk? What they talking about, Roland? I, 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 I need, I need <laughs> folk to, I, I, I need 
everybody listening and watching right now to understand why I am so passionate about this. Mm -hmm. It is because the lead editorial of Freedom's Journal on March 16th, 1827 said, we wish to plead our own cause. Too mm. long have others spoken for us. Mm. If you do not know the history of the black press, you would not know of something that was called the Abbott Monthly. <laughs> Robert Abbott, the founder of the Chicago Defender, created a black magazine that was the equivalent of the New Yorker. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Had a circulation of 100,000. Mm. Y'all, that 100,000. The leading writers at the time, Richard Wright couldn't get published, but he was published by Robert Abbott. Y'all got to understand, before Langston Hughes became Langston Hughes, Langston Hughes was writing for the Chicago Defender. That's mm. right. Mm. That's right. Ethel Payne started writing her fictional stories for the Abbott Monthly, and then later, the Chicago Defender. Yes. If we, Erica, mm -hmm. continue to allow others to monetize our culture, mm. oof, and then we not monetize our culture. That means that the see y'all. Let let let, <laughs> let, 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 let let me break this thing down for everybody to understand how the money flows. Come on, brother. The white ad agencies are snatching multicultural dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, there used to be see y'all. There used to be a budget call that that's multicultural money. They were like, that's Negro money. We don't care about that money. We got mm. general market money. Mm. But then when the demographic shifts begin to take place, Obama gets elected in 2009. See, this is, and, and see, and I got to go there. Obama didn't learn this lesson. Mm. Obama did not put the resources in black media during his campaign and allowed David Pluff and David Axelrod to ignore his edict to give money to black media. And what ended up happening was white Democrats said, well, hell, look at what Obama's doing. We don't have to spend it ourselves. That, what I'm trying to say is when you mm. black in a position of authority, what you cannot do is negate your own because they are watching and then they will then follow your lead. That's right. Yeah. So what ends up happening? We then don't get political dollars. Then the multicultural market begins to dry up. You used to have agencies, Eugene Morris, uh, R.J. Dale. Go look at the black enterprise list of the top black ad agencies 20 years ago and see how many of them exist today. Mm. Mm. So then multicultural, y'all, becomes general market. General market, y'all, means white. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what they do to us. See, y'all don't... Uh, see, the, re I, the reason I need everybody watching to understand why I'm keep hitting this thing and why I'm going to keep hitting this thing is because what they then say is, the agency says, well, we don't need, we don't need to buy Roller Martin Unfiltered. We can buy the Young Turks. They, in fact, they don't even buy the Young Turks. They say, we don't even... We, no, no, no. This is what they say. We gonna buy the NBA on TNT since black men watch basketball, and that's how we gonna sell our products to them. That's right. They say, oh, we, 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 we don't need to buy, uh, well, Own is no longer, she sold 95% to Discovery, so she only, Oprah only owns 5%, but when she owned it, they said, we don't need to buy Own. We could just go over here, uh, and uh, spend our money on how to get away with murder and scandal, and we're going to pick y'all black people up on the way. My God. I'm describing for y'all how the game is being played. <laughs> and so then what they do is, when we call, the first question, uh, 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 what are your metrics? <sighs> because they have set an artificial number that we can't reach. Well, see, the problem is, thanks to y'all, it's a little hard for them to fight our numbers. 
How about that? Because, see, when we come in and we say uh, we average 20 to 30 million views a month. Ooh. Now they like. Damn. Um. Um. Now, mind y'all, we took, we have not bought any advertising. Mm-hmm. Do y'all understand? Mm-hmm. If I could afford to spend $25,000 a month on advertising, my 20 to 30 million viewers, views a month would probably be 40 to 60 million a month. Mm-hmm. You be giving out the image awards. Then they really got to come out and spend the money. <laughs> Erica, this is, I, I, I need black people to be extremely cognizant of yeah. what is black targeted mm-hmm. and what is black owned. When you right. talk BET, and I, a lot of people that I love and appreciate them, those are ad deals being cut by Viacom. Right. Mm. Viacom. Okay? And so, we got to be real careful, black people, by continuing, oh my goodness, that's wonderful, that's hype, but no, 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 but, but who owns it? And then, who does that then support? Then what does their staff look like? How many black mm-hmm. folks on their staff? How many folks are on the, on the sports of directors? How many senior executives? What are the black vendors do they support? See, when you start mm-hmm. breaking those things down, that's how you really get at the real issue because Erica, we don't do that. We gonna look up one day and we're gonna be asking somebody else for permission can they yes. cover us? And then we're going to say, well, why aren't they featuring so-and-so? Because we don't own it. And we, mm-hmm. we don't own it, we don't control it. And we, we don't own it, we don't control it, then we do not wield the power to speak truth to our people, even if sometimes it take like, tastes like castor oil, because mm-hmm. some of y'all need to understand, you're being fed candy. Yes, sir. Mm. Other places. Mm. When that ain't all that we need. Erica, go ahead. I mean, the doors of the church are open. Uh, I think that this is really time for everybody to pop open, cash out, hit Roland Martin Unfiltered, and and, and, yes. and give. Um, because yes. you plainly laid out how we are going to end up giving away our culture that we say that we own and that we work hard for. It is semantics. Um, it's not semantics, black targeted, and as you roll, uh, laid out for us, rolling and black on, there is a very uh, distinct difference. And so there is something to be said about the platform that you rolled out uh, in 2018, seeing what was happening. So you were not looking at 2017, you were not looking at 2018, you were looking at beyond. And that 20 to 30 million people trust Roland Martin, trust Roland Martin Unfiltered, where you can Monday through Friday see panelists that are black, that reflect the community, that reflect a diverse um, set of views, but very Mm -hmm. much so uh, committed to bringing truth because that is your brand, truth is your brand. And that the Mm -hmm. people that come in to speak, the expert panels, they're black as well. So we're talking about when, uh, especially since you talked about COVID, that critical, very critical time from March up until now, but especially March, those spring and summer months, you could not not turn on Roland Martin Unfiltered and not see a black person that had been in medicine for 10, 20, and 30 years. That was when people really discovered that, oh, wow, that they're black people that are virologists, that are immunologists, that are researchers. Absolutely. Yes. That black people had already always been there but that they were not attracted to mainstream media. Mainstream media already has their list of people that they pull for opinions and to get um, expert um, um, expert opinions on uh, regarding specific subject, subject matters. All of that happened here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. So this, again, is a call for engaged citizenry, a call to action. I would much rather be listening to a program that's going to, um, uh, that, that is going to help me throughout my day that features um, and stands behind people that look exactly like me. And so um, I think that this is something that absolutely bears repeating. It's important for people to know exactly what they're getting when they're actually selecting 
um, what they're actually looking at. That's critically important. And so, again, the call to action for this as well is for people to make sure that they are donating to this platform. I'm not saying anything that me or anybody else has not done. If we want to continue to make sure that we retain some um, power over our culture, then we have to um, respond and we have to donate and we have to uplift those people who are in our culture that are committed to a thing. When you think about Roland Martin and you think about truth, and I think about truth and I think about journalism. And so if those yes. are two things that Roland Martin is committed to, if those are the two things that he's engaged to, if, if during this time where this is pretty much what people can expect and that you're also traveling, that you're making sure that you're hitting all corners to hear from all different voices, voters, elected, people that are organizing, people that are mobilizing, then the least that we can do on the other side of the screen is to make sure that it is supported. And uh, we have seen, by way of people who have been doing well in entrepreneurial endeavors, people are not lacking money. People have money. Take your yes. money. You know, Dr. Carr has told us this, you know, put something with something. Take your money. Do it today and make sure you donate to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let, 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 let me let me let me Reese the thing that and, and, I, and I'll be honest, Reese, it, it, it does piss me off at times when I see black celebrities, folk who I know personally, mm -hmm. when I see, oh, yeah. Man, uh, man, watch so and so. Oh, I watch so and so. Big up, big up, big up, and big up. And but when Warnock and Osoff were scrapping in Georgia, I ain't. I didn't run into none of them people uh, in Georgia. Mm. <laughs> I hello. In um, <laughs> in two weeks. I'm gonna be on the ground in St. Louis. Yes, sir. Talking to, doing a town hall for one of the black mayoral candidates. I know who I ain't gonna run into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thing, and the thing is, then I listen to the same folk talk about ownership, what's ours, what we need. We gotta tell our own story. And I, I know how folk feel. It's a bunch of people they hate, hate Tyler Perry. But let me tell y'all something right now. You can hate Tyler Perry movies all you want to. Mm -hmm. And you can have disagreements on Tyler Perry for any number of things. But Tyler Perry, in, in fact, uh, Keenan, I want you, Keenan, after today's show, I want you to get the Tyler Perry speech that he did at NABJ. I want you to stream it after the show. Um, because when he spoke to NABJ in 2018, Reese, he talked about damn they table, building your own table. And he, but this is what he said. He said, if I serve my people, my people will take care of me. Mm. No question about it. Black people built that 250-acre studio in Atlanta. This is true. Black people are the reason Ty Tyler has his second or third jet. Black people are the reason he was able, according to Cicely Tyson in her book, uh, paid her salary two, three, four times as much. Mm -hmm. I sent him a text. I'm not going to say how much. I know how much he paid her for a movie. He told me. I was like, damn! <laughs> and I said to him, now that's black power. Mm -hmm. And I think too many of our folk, again, we get so consumed. And, and let me clear. I, I keep telling y'all, I have no issue, and I'm, I, as a vice president of NABJ, I'm fighting for black people at ABC. We just sent out a statement yes. calling for ABC News to name a first black president 
of a network news division, and I said that it was ABC News that in 1962 uh, named my alpha brother Mal Good as the first black national correspondent of network news. It was in 1978 that ABC named Max Robinson as the first black, first black evening news anchor, and I said, ABC, it's time, Disney, it's time for y'all to break, make history as the first black network news president. I support, I sent her a text last night and today, Rashida Jones, the first black president of a cable news network. She started last Monday on, on that, no, this Monday on MSNBC. I'm fighting for more black folks on air there, but while I'm fighting for them, I'm damn sure fighting for us to own our own stuff because here's what I do know. And I just saw Angela Rice. She's no longer on CNN. I saw her on Joanne Reed show. I know who she came on first. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I, I know, I know who Tiffany Cross came on TV, came on TV first. I know before Gianna Caldwell was at Fox News where he was on TV first. I know where Shamichael Singleton and Paris Denard and David Swerdlick got the opportunities. Before <laughs> Laura Coates hosted anything on CNN, she hosted my show. See, I can go down the line here. The point I'm saying is, none of those folk get the shot unless they come through a black-owned platform that mm. affirmed their expertise, Reese. Hmm. Absolutely. And I, that's, the, that's the thing. It's like I said, it's no shade to anybody else. I'm rooting for everybody black. Mm. I'm rooting for black people in all the spaces, in the white spaces and in the black spaces. But all I'm saying is, don't put the black media spaces in the back of the bus. Don't try to put the black media spaces down a notch. Mm -hmm. Like it's not up to the par and the caliber because it doesn't right. have that white validation because it doesn't have that white cosign. That's all that I'm saying. And we have the power to validate ourselves. You know, like you said about Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry, you know, people feel whatever they feel about his, his stuff, but he is putting black people on, and you see them go on mm -hmm. to do a variety of things, and it's black power. We have trillions of dollars of buying power, and other people are getting in on it, and we need to get in on it, and we need to be the ones to really see the value in ourselves. That's the only point that I'm trying to make, and I'm glad that y'all, everybody laid it out, because we got to keep repeating it that the onus is yeah. on us. We can't complain mm -hmm. about, oh, you don't have black this, you don't have black that, or the one black person mm -hmm. that was on that white network or the one black person that has that show, that show gets canceled and everybody is up in arms about that. Don't, don't let it just be one. Don't let it just be two or three. We have to own our own stuff and we have to put just as much support around our own as we do around mm -hmm. things that are being propped up. And I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but being propped up by the mainstream media. It is a uh, fi final comment on this one, Greg, and I I'll, I'll leave it I'll leave it for you to take us home. Y'all, it was a whole bunch of other stuff we had on, on the show. Uh, Y'all can blame Reese. She threw the whole show off. Sorry. Um, Sorry. But we've been, we've been, and, and, and I, just, I, just, I just need folk to understand that there's no piece of this game I haven't seen. Mm. Right. Uh, I, I had somebody, I had somebody, I forgot who that fool was. So this fool actually tried to question my black media credentials. Um, and I cracked up laughing because I think, <laughs> I think the last count, this is like my 13th or 14th black owned media experience. I've done black radio, black newspaper, mm -hmm. black magazine, mm -hmm. black online, mm -hmm. black television. Yes, sir. I don't know nobody else. <laughs> One you wearing? Are you counting the one I, that you wearing? I, I, I don't know anybody else, and I, do, I don't. I don't know anybody else. I don't know anybody else who's worked in every medium of television that's black owned. Mm. Yes, sir. And I've done it as a reporter, as an editor, and as an executive. So when I'm giving y'all this information, I want y'all to understand: I'm sitting in the room. Yeah. I'm hearing the conversations. I'm giving you direct what the numbers are. I'm telling you, when we sought political advertising, the offer that came back to us was 22 cents on the dollar. Hmm. That meant what we got was 78% less than what we asked for. 
I told y'all before when Brett Pulley did the book, The Billion Dollar Bet, the unauthorized biography of BET. In the book, BET was charging $1,500 for a 30-second ad, and MTV was charging $8,000 for the same 30-second ad. That means that there was a tax on blackness. Mm -hmm. So what I need y'all to understand, and see, and I know, y'all, I've heard it. Yeah, Roland being a hard ass, Roland being a stick-up artist, Roland sitting here, uh, why can't he just be happy? <laughs> y'all, I've had black people who are across the table say that. Of course. I've had I've had black one person who's an alpha. Me and him gonna have a conversation one day. Trust me. Thanks. Well, Roland's just a noise maker. Roland's just you know he he too aggressive. You know he he too he 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 too he too pushy. You know. But the same person when they were catching a hell on a political campaign, guess who they called to bail their ass out? Mm. See, I need y'all to understand. I have long described myself as I am the Negro behind the glass case break in case of emergency. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> it's a whole yes, bunch of people been talking <laughs> trash about me. But then when they need to swing, they like, break the glass. <laughs> <laughs> the reason black media is in the state, let me be clear, y'all. The reason black owned media is in the state it, it is in right now is because there are scared black people who won't open their mouths. Yeah. The reason black-owned media is in the state that it is in right now is because someone will give them a dollar when they should be giving them $10, and they accept the dollar, and they say, why, thank you. Thank you. That's so wonderful. I am not a parking lot militant. Mm. I am not going to be the person who stands in the parking lot and complains about what they do on the inside. I am going to be that brother and have always been that brother who said what is on my mind in the parking lot and on the 10th floor. Mm -hmm. Greg, the only way forward for Black-owned media is to grow a spine and to use the one thing that we have, the pen, the paper, the microphone, the platform, to call out injustice where we see it and be willing to walk away from a bad deal by letting folk know you are not going to play me small. Take us home. No, brother, you, you've already done it. I, I want to just add my voice to, to Reese and to Erica on the importance of your vision to see that this is where it was going in terms of technology, first of all. Everybody's coming over this way. The disruption mm -hmm. has uh, put this whole thing in a precarious situation. And I want to just say one thing about the nature of this show that we all know, but it bears repeating at this moment. This is the space that changes all the other spaces. You know, I don't really watch white face and commercial media because particularly the academics they have on who are black, a lot of them are my friends. And it pains me sometimes to watch them swallow their tongues and hearts as these open white nationalists like Joe Scarborough and others uh, try to keep their little settler project going. And it's going to disintegrate, boys. You can't save it. But to watch people who look like me, who I know if they weren't there but here, would be talking different, 
some of them. Some of them Negroes actually believe that, which is hilarious to me. But <laughs> just watch them sit there with that pain look on their face. It, 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 but, but, but there's a different look on their face now than there was two years ago. To go to Erica's point, since this show has emerged, and before that, when you were on TV One, but especially since this show has emerged, you've seen an emboldenment in some of them. Why? This is the only news place anywhere where you could open a show with Ari Berman, one of the country's leading experts, who you will see on all those other places, NBC, CNBC, wherever you want to put it, MSNBC, CNN. You you might see him followed by Greg Paulist, who you're not going to see on CNN mm-hmm. or MSNBC, because that's neoliberal media, but you might see on Democracy Now! with uh, Amy Goodman, which then followed by three, four members of the Congressional Black Caucus who you might see on seeing it, but they've already been framed by the unvarnished truth and in between each segment, uh, a roster of black folk, as Reese and Erica have said, who have deep expertise across the way, framing the whole conversation, emptying then into stories that are not only not covered in uh, media, when they are covered, aren't given the proper frame. Oh, Cicely Tyson, and then they show all the Hollywood movies and ignore everything about Cicely Tyson's life. And then in the middle of a show, you pivot and get person after person who white people think they know, but who don't know, who come to this space and are able to talk like a Danny Glover, are able to talk, you know, like a Susan Taylor. And then we leave this space, as Eric said, inspired, renewed. And what that means is, and I, I'll end with this, I think about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because I'm, I, yeah, I was a freshman at Tennessee State when Jesse Jackson ran for president the first time. And I remember when the Secret Service wouldn't give him security, as you do as well, when they wouldn't give him security because they didn't consider him a serious candidate. And who did he reach out to? His neighbor in Chicago, Louis Farrakhan. The Fruit of Islam were the first security for Jesse Jackson. And when the Fruit showed up and Jesse's getting momentum, the feds decided now it's time to give him secret service. Yeah, because see, when black people get in trouble, we all know the Nation of Islam, but you don't want to say it on CNN because you're scared to lose your job until they fire you, at which point you ask the final call to run the story. So, yes, but the existence of the black press, the existence of Roland Martin Unfiltered is like that scene in Malcolm X when the great Al Freeman Jr., my faculty colleague at Howard, now an ancestor, one of the great actors who should have got, if them little damn statues mean nothing, and they don't, an Academy Award alongside uh, Denzel Washington for Malcolm X. But of course, they were only going to give uh, Denzel Washington Academy Awards for playing like Dirty Cop, because y'all don't understand how this award game goes. They're framing your ass forever in the memory of America. But when Al Freeman Jr. playing Elijah Muhammad pours that glass of water and dumps that ink in it and shows, Mal- and shows uh, Denzel Washington and says, brother... If the people only have this to drink, they'll drink it. And then he takes another glass, pours a clean glass of water. He says, but if they have a choice, they will always drink the clean glass of water. Don't get distracted with this BS, with these little dodge things, people hiring people to do all this. No, Roland Martin Unfiltered is pouring a clean glass of water. And as long mm-hmm. as you are pouring that clean glass of water, the people are going to choose the clean glass. And eventually... Mm-hmm. These people who are pouring this water and putting a little ink in it, and I mean that metaphor every kind of way you can imagine, going to look and see as these people are drinking this clean water, they turn to the Negroes they have on the payroll and say, beat us up a little harder. Because I remember when Don Lemon was on the other side. But guess what? The presence of places like this then made Don Lemon blacker, then made Eddie Gloud blacker, then made Joy Reid blacker then made everybody in them spaces a little blacker because it is the existence of this space that moves the needle, not the existence of people in those other spaces. Don't ever get mm. that twisted. Support this institution. And you're going to watch. You're going to see how this whole thing is going to change. But we got to prop you. We got to keep you going, brother. Greg, if y'all heard Greg mention the, uh, what I was wearing. So uh, this is my high school, Jack Kids High School. Uh, in Houston, Texas, one of the most historic high schools uh, in the city. Uh, I sent uh, the uh, principal and the, um, as well as the, uh, the superintendent, Greta Lathan. And let me go ahead and say this right now. To the, to the Houston Independent School District trifling as board of trustees. That black woman has saved that district 
the Texas Education Agency was going to take over HISD. It was going to be the largest state takeover in United States history. But that sister came in as the interim superintendent and she saved it. And there's a cabal of board of trustees, most of them Latino, who wanted to bring in Latino superintendent who failed before. He was previously the superintendent. He failed. <laughs> because the previous superintendent, Carranza, left to go to New York City. And then when they, they could have voted for her to get the job, but they voted to keep the interim tag, Granita Lathan deserves to be the superintendent of the Houston Independent School District. And I need y'all to understand that she is doing great things for that district, for those schools, and y'all need to have the guts to get out of the way and allow her to do that. And so that's one of the reasons why, and, you know, and look, my publicist, she can get mad about it, I don't care. Just so y'all understand why we have to also pay things forward. So first, you see me rocking my Yates colors. You see, you see what the colors in the logo are. Because you got to understand <laughs> where this thing comes from. And I showed y'all before, because I was rocking today uh, my School of Communications uh, jacket. Uh, that, uh, and I was the only TV student who got one. Uh, because, uh, and it was so funny. Yeah, y'all, this is a true story. Shirley Hall was the School of Communications coordinator. Um, and I was taught, and so the newspaper people used to always get, uh, they always get jackets. And I, I was like, yo, how the hell, why are they always getting jackets? And I was a television. So I'm standing in her doorway and my boy David was standing right there. Y'all, she literally, this, this, I can't believe she even fixed her mouth to let this come out her mouth. She said to me, you hadn't done anything to earn one. <laughs> when I say I let loose on that white woman, mm. and when I told her, I said, who you think you talking to? I said, for four years, every major program at this school was shot by me. I said, I'm the top student in every single field here, TV, radio, newspaper. There's nothing I can't do. I ran. Down. <laughs> Y'all, this was her look on her face. <laughs> she picks the phone up, calls Thelma Johnson. Uh, Miss Johnson, uh, I'm sending Roland Martin down. Can you order whatever jacket that he wants? <laughs> and she hung up. Now, I said, y'all, I was a high school senior. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to let this woman sit here and diminish what the hell work I put in when I was in high school. Mm. Uh, and so, so this is actually a, a replica jacket of that. So yeah, you damn right, I got that jacket. And on the back of, of course, that's why we, I, I had Mr. TV put on the back. Cause that's what the, stu uh -oh. that's, that's what the students <laughs> called me when I was there. So I'm always, I'm always repping JY and that's why. And I go ahead and tell y'all first, and again, Tasha, my publicist, she gonna be upset, but she'll get over it. Uh, that's why uh, I created a $25,000 scholarship fund at Jack Yates High School to annually give a $1,000 scholarship to the, a student in the School of Communications, yes, which produced yes. me, and a student in the regular school. So every year, $2,000 will be given to two students uh, to attend either a two or four year institution because part of the problem is that there are a lot of, pro too many scholarships are only for four year institutions and not for two year institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, they, do, they are going to have to write an essay that I will read uh, and then whoever, and then those two students, uh, when I pick them, uh, I will bring them on this show. I'm saying all of that because, uh, listen to me, y'all. When, when, when you support black media and when we force advertising agencies to fund black media, then those of us who own black media can then take those resources and give it back to our people. Right. The only way I can afford that, and I've already sent the money to the Houston Independent School District. They already got the money. And then that, so that means that that money right now will pay for this scholarship uh, two grand a year uh, for the next uh, 11, 12 years. And I won't wait, simply replenish that so it's always there. But the point I'm making is this here. 
That's why you got to support when we own stuff. Mm -hmm. Because when we own, and look, I, look, I'm telling you right now, I already have, you, you, go, you look at these journalism schools on HBCU campuses, okay? Oh, I have, look, I already know my plans to say, you know what, here's going to be an allocation to my high school uh, and have the School of Communications named after me. TSU is right across the street. Texas Southern. Texas brother. Southern. Yes, sir. See, this is what I need y'all to understand. Are these media companies that are black targeted, what are they giving back to black people? Mm-hmm. Are the media, all these black targeted media companies, what programs do they have for HBCU students? Mm. Are they engaging with those HBCUs? What are they doing to bring in more black journalists into the field? This is why you have got to stop letting folk give money to black targeted. Because, see, when you support black targeted and black targeted ain't supporting you, all you're doing is making another community richer and then you are simply making our community poor. Mm. That's why we are focused on this. That's why you have to understand that when you support what is black owned, black owned will support you. Folks, if yes, you want to join our Bring the Funk fan club, you can do so. Cash app. If you get a YouTube, understand, we do. it's a 55-45 split on YouTube. So if you give on YouTube, that's fine, but we only get 55%. If you give directly to us, we get the whole 100%. Cash app is dollar sign RM unfiltered. PayPal is paypal.me forward slash Martin unfiltered. Venmo.com is RM unfiltered. You can support us via Zelle. By, uh, the email there is roland at rolandsmartin.com. Uh, then you can also uh, send us a money order. We don't have the address. We'll have it up um, uh, tomorrow. 1625 K Street, Northwest Suite 400, Washington, D.C., 2006. Uh, let me quickly do this here. I want to hopefully I ain't got no photos for um, for Erica. Um, uh, I, I, <laughs> fact, hold, hold on. This, this, hold on. Hold on. See, just think. Just, hold on. I just realized that photo is right here. Hold on. Oh, no, 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 Roland, don't do it, brother. We love Erica. Look, the man is not crazy. Don't, 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 don't. My man, don't be talking about Henry. Henry don't work for you. My man, I pay Henry. He better zoom in. That's right, Carly Jordan to Erica with love. Look at that clean brother. He ain't an alpha, but he dressed like us. Henry, zoom in. For everybody who missed the story, this brother, y'all, sent me, he sent me a check. He said, I want you to read this on Thursday. He's not an alpha, but he is clean. And man, he said he loved the Thursday panel and he just loved him some Erica Savage. Woo! He said, and my man said, be sure to get this photo to Erica. And so, just so y'all know, I keep this photo right here on my set. Right, Henry, go to a wide shot. Give me a wide shot. I, I keep this photo right here on my set. So when we return back in studio, let me put this down. Y'all can see it. I, it's right here. So when COVID, is, when COVID is over and the panel comes back in studio, this gonna be right here uh, so I can give that thing to Erica. It's right there. Y'all. So I, I just want to, yeah, I just want to go ahead. So let me give a shout out right here. Uh, Ingrid John. Ingrid, I appreciate it. Y'all, Ingrid made a $100 donation. Uh, I told y'all, anybody who give more than $50, y'all get a personal shout out, just like in church. Uh, let's see here real quick. Uh, let's see here. Who is this here? Who is this here? There we go. All right, who we got right here? Uh, Isabella Johnson. Uh, first of all, um, this check right here, Ingrid said, Roland, you are doing really good work. I will continue to follow you. Ingrid, I appreciate your $100 donation. Uh, this here is uh, Isabella. Thank you very much for all you do. I really enjoy watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. You bring the truth and facts. I thank you once. I thank you twice. I thank you, thank you, thank you. Isabella, I appreciate that. I appreciate your $50 check as well. I got two more to open and y'all, we done. Uh, ooh, I hope I get, I get. Hey, fellas, if any of y'all out there 
uh, want me to uh, show your photo and your affection for Erica, please send it in. I'll be more than happy uh, to do that. Uh, I'll be more than happy. Uh, yeah, I know she blushing, but she get over it. Uh, Jerry McLean. Uh, Jerry, I appreciate your $50 money order, my brother. Thank you so very much. Uh, and last one I'm going to open today. I got a whole bunch, y'all. I got a whole bunch uh, at the house that I got to open and, and you know, we got a city in. Y'all make it easy on me when y'all give electronically because I ain't got to scan each one of these things and, like, literally uh, do it. By, but uh, Cheryl Pixley, Cheryl, I appreciate that from Seattle, Washington. Thank you for supporting our show. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, you know, and so, again, uh, I need y'all to understand, last year, y'all gave $672,000 to this show. Uh, last year. Our, our target goal is a million. Our goal is if, if 20,000 of our fans give $50 each, we can hit a million to fund this show, to fund the great work that we're doing. Uh, and so please, that's the number that we're trying to hit. But if you can't give 50, if you can give more, that's great. Uh, if you, can, you got less, that's fine as well. Uh, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for all of your support again, uh, because again, y'all make it possible. Uh, and here's the other thing. Your support makes it possible for me to go hard against these, these other people because that's how we're able to be funded. This is no different than when black people, black people funded the black church. And, by the, and see, that allowed the preacher to have the courage to speak truth uh, from the pulpit. The day black preachers stop speaking truth is when their funding sources did not come from their people. That's another whole show. Uh, but I'm just going to leave that one right there. Uh, but I got to close on this. Go to my iPad. So, uh, Reese did the, the, the busted challenge to announce that uh, she's pregnant. Uh, her and her husband, congratulations. Uh, uh, I, was, I, was, I was wondering why she stopped cussing so much. Now we know why. She don't want it to have an impact. She don't want that baby to come out the womb cussing. Uh, and so, uh, so congratulations, uh, Reese. I'm still gonna be cussing. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, that is it, uh, Erica, uh, Greg, Reese. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, I will see y'all tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm going to let y'all do it with me on three. One, two, three. Holla! Holla! <laughs>